Welcome to all of you. Uh, this is a very uh, exciting uh, experiment also to me. Um, and I'm a, as, as uh, Rose said, um, uh, I'm a medical historian and I was asked to inform you a little bit about the history of pandemics and maybe also devote some attention to the question, what can we learn from history, if at all? So we are looking at a true pandemic. Between February 24th and April 19, you can see it here. This is the dashboard uh, that is uh, held by the Johns Hopkins uh, Medical Faculty. We have moved from 80,000 confirmed cases to almost two and a half million confirmed cases. And we've also moved from uh, more than 2,000 deaths to 160 deaths in less than two months time. So the 11th of March, the WHO officially declared this a pandemic. So this leads to the question, what is a pandemic? And this is taken from an article that was co-authored by uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, the man that has become very famous standing next to uh, Donald Trump. Um, and he co-authored this uh, article um, explain to, to the rest of the world what exactly a pandemic is, because there's a lot of uh, uh, confusion about it. And these are the criteria that uh, they think uh, should be met uh, to allow us to speak about um, uh, There has to be wide geographic extension, there has to be explosiveness, there has to be immunity on behalf of the host uh, population, it has to be new, it has to be severe, and it is uh, both infectious and contagious. Just by way of example, a few examples in al alphabetical order. Um, you can see uh, them here and you can tell right away that we are talking uh, serious business here. It, it uh, varies from plague to cholera, AIDS, SARS, and now COVID-19. <clears throat> The response of the authorities, both the scientific and the political authorities, was, um, well, a little bit hesitant maybe in the beginning, but as we uh, just saw just uh, uh, half an hour ago, again, this couple, the prime minister and the director of the RIVM, um, who embody science and politics, and together come up with a scientific analysis of what is uh, uh, the case and uh, also decided what should be done uh, to counter this enormous threat. So what can we learn from history? That is basically the question that I will be dealing with um, during this hour. So we uh, will be looking at past epidemics and the past has been called the foreign country, something that is unfair, that is strange, that is odd, that maybe some people uh, are inclined to forget about because, the, the, well, it's, it's, it's all dead and gone, right? But the claim of historians and of this uh, lecture is that visiting that country might be very useful because it may give us empathy with people in the past because uh, it is a very ahistorical attitude to uh, disregard them and uh, presume that they are, um, uh, well, stupid, innocent uh, people. So we, we, it, it, it um, may give us empathy, uh, humility also, because um, we come to realize that we indeed share a lot with people in the 16th, 17th, 19th century, and in the end it may give us wisdom. Maybe most importantly, History and historical knowledge may be throwing ourselves from a rather complacent position. Uh, we are inclined to put ourselves in the middle of the universe and also at the pinnacle of human development. So the outline of uh, my lecture is as follows. First, I will uh, talk a little bit about pandemics as a phase in epidemiological transition. Then the second part will be devoted to the rhythm of pandemics in general. Um, then I will speak about two pandemics, very generally speaking. And finally, I will um, say a little bit about global health and the need to combine 
the two approaches that I just I identified in the third section. So first part one, pandemics as a phase in epidemiological transition. And I'm using a book written by William McNeil, Plagues and People, and um, very old book, you may be said, uh, even be inclined to think and, and not relevant anymore. And it, it is indeed experimental, it is rather speculative, but it's also prophetic. And it uh, points the way um, to, to look in terms of historical uh, and even genetic research. I will come to that later. And a very new and miraculous thing that William McNeil did in this book is take, as a historian, a new perspective. Because traditionally, uh, historians were inclined to take a great man perspective. So they were inclined to look at human agency. So, for example, looking at Napoleon and the great things he thought and did, the way he changed the history of Europe. McNeil, <clears throat> on the other hand, is taking an epidemiological perspective, introducing new drivers of historical change namely bacteria and viruses, arguing that bacteria and viruses may have been more important than Napoleon, the viruses, his army, that is. So when he was marching through Europe, maybe the ideas and the genius of Napoleon was not as important as the viruses he took with him in his army. Having said that, you can look at kingdoms and empires as ecological structures that are defended in two particular ways. So the, the traditional uh, view would be um, that they are defended militarily by, by force. And McNeil argues that there are uh, disease frontiers uh, separating two uh, ecological uh, systems. And this equilibrium is only disturbed by expansive war, like for example, Napoleon or the Mongols or well, others, I, I will come to that later. Long distance trade, like in colonial times and uh, imperial times, or pilgrimage or migration. They constitute an epidemic invasion of virgin populations where people live who do not have acquired immunity to the disease that the armies and the traders bring with them, causing outbreak and crisis. And this is really catastrophic crisis. And this is the cyclical pattern of history according to McNeil. So it basically he's arguing in terms of epidemiological crisis, adjustments and transition. And from an eco uh, ecological equilibrium within a given region to population growth in a region until a natural limit is reached and people um, are inclined to look for food um, and goods somewhere else. So there's a spillover of people, goods, and uh, micro uh, biological agents from one disease pool to another, causing an epidemic outbreak in the host region that they uh, come to visit. And after this, this catastrophe, when things cool down, there's domestication of the disease, and the, uh, it will only flare up um, every once in a while but then it will have reached its epidemic, endemic phase. So in the beginning, and of course, where to begin, there's no such thing as the beginning, of course, in history, but McNeil begins his story uh, 500 BC. And he claims that there were four more or less autonomous disease pools in Eurasia. And you see them here, the Middle East, the Yellow River Plain, Ganges Valley, and the Sea Coast. And this is his new periodization of history. So one period is separated by the, uh, from the other, not by, for example, something like uh, the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Second World War, political caesuras, in other words, but rather by epidemiological upheavals. And there are four really serious crises, according to McNeil, and I will just um, go over them one by one, forgetting about the first one because you you uh, you get the idea uh, after that, some time. But so I will directly move to the second Eurasian transition, the one that we know best, uh, which is um, when the Mongols decided to move west 
from the Asian steppes to Europe. So the Mongol Empire established by Genghis Khan was thriving, but there was a need to expand and they expanded to the east, but also to the west, intensified movement over land uh, and people crossing political, cultural, and most importantly, epidemiological borders, bringing Yersinia pestis to the European steppes. So what we see is that Frank military Frank, and trade... Yeah. This is a question from Oscar. Okay. Oscar, zou you willen stellen? Uh, yeah, I can ask uh, In English, I think. Um, is it yeah. uh, uh, like global warming that you there that you can see that in the world there uh, just like global warming is getting worse and worse that there are more getting more pandemics um, than there were used uh, earlier it used to be so that there uh, between pandemics there will be lesser time every time. I'm not sure if you can say that. That's well, comes to global warming uh, in, in the present. If you give me some time, uh, uh, please bear with me. And if you still have that question, then ask it again. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we see military and trade movement by the Mongols moving west, causing Black Death. So in five years' time, uh, Europe, the European population was decimated. And out of all the patients, 60 to 7 percent of the people were dying, and 30 percent of the total European population died. It is estimated. And this was a very, very serious crisis, as said. And, and Europe took six generations to recover from it. And so we have the stabilization um, around 1500 when the plague was. Um, domesticated, you could say, and became an endemic disease. And the, these are two documents coming from this uh, endemic phase in the 17th century. We saw when uh, the plague broke out, then uh, doctors were asked, is this the plague, yes or no? Is it contagious, yes or no? And what kind of measures should we take? So to the left, you see a learned treatise by a medical doctor leading to, if and when it was established that this was indeed the contagious plague, leading to ordinances against the plague, leading to a complete lockdown, uh, leading to quarantine, isolation, and leading to um, plague doctors, plague surgeons, plague apothecaries, plague midwives, et cetera, et cetera. And they, uh, they, they uh, were given high salaries because it, it was very dangerous indeed to engage with contagious plague so then the second or in, in, in uh, McNeil the third uh, transition which he calls the transatlantic exchange but it's also known as the Colombian exchange because it was caused it was initiated by the Portuguese and Spanish um, conquistadores moving east from Europe from Spain to uh, what is now called America Columbus thought he had discovered uh, India but in fact, it was America, and um, they, they, they saw riches, they saw paradise, and they, saw, uh, they, they, they thought, okay, let's, let's settle down here, um, uh, have a colony, and enrich the Spanish uh, king. And what happened there, indeed, because with only a handful of soldiers, Cortes, one of the Spanish conquistadores, succeeded in conquering the Aztec Empire, which was a, uh, uh, an empire consisting of millions of inhabitants. It was a high civilization. Uh, and in terms of military strength, the, the uh, Aztecs um, should have been able to uh, conquer and defeat the, uh, the Spanish without any trouble. But the opposite happened. Uh, because the empire was ravaged by smallpox uh, that the Spanish had taken with them and to which the Aztecs had no immunity. So when Cortes returned on his second visit to Middle America, um, there was massive uh, mortality and um, Moctezuma, the king of the Aztecs, was murdered. The Aztecs were demoralized because their king had been killed, but also 
because of brutality. And the Spanish soldiers, the handful of Spanish soldiers, had an easy job dealing the final blow and um, conquered um, the Aztec Empire. But it's called an exchange because on their return, the Spanish brought syphilis back to Europe. So here we see, um, well, an image of what the Aztec Empire may have looked like before the Spanish destroyed almost everything. There's hardly anything left anymore of that. You will see the initial fights between the, uh, the Spanish soldiers and the Aztecs, but this is the true story, uh, which leads to a comment on behalf of McNeil, saying disease has always been a more efficient killer than human muscles. And this is the final blow, the Aztecs surrendering to Cortes and um, these, the Spanish soldiers disposing of the body of the king, uh, throwing him in a river. And this is the, the picture that, that sums it all up, the, the transatlantic or Columbian exchange. So you can see cattle, horses, pigs, wheat and rye moving from Europe to North America. Um, and you can see uh, maize, potatoes, tobacco, beans, squash, peppers and cacao to Europe. But um, traders and soldiers brought smallpox with them to the Americas. And from Africa later on in, during the slave trade era, malaria and yellow fever to South America. And in return, they received syphilis. And then the final phase, the final transition in the book by, um, by uh, McNeil is um, it's devoted to cholera, uh, which was the, the, the biggest killer of the 19th century. This is a very special story because it's a story about medicine becoming a science and the state establishing itself. And the 19th century is very much the, the story of the state collaborating um, in, in the first um, the first uh, sign of modern public health as we now know it. Cholera uh, hits Europe in 1832, again a spillover from Southeast Asia due to colonial exchange. In 1817 there had been a cholera epidemic in Calcutta and uh, more than 10 years later it had reached the rest of the world causing uh, five waves of cholera in Europe. Here we see uh, morbidity and mortality that was massive all across Europe. But now the new response in the 19th century was um, twofold. First of all, um, there was a response in terms of environmental medicine. So medical doctors um, had learned from the heritage of Hippocrates, 4th century BC, and Hippocrates had argued that there is a correlation between environmental and morbidity and mortality on the other. So he advised doctors to study environmental factors uh, such as the quality of the water, the soil, the air they breathe, um, and, and also um, uh, diagnose the kind of uh, diseases that they saw and then try to establish a pattern, a causal reality between one and the other. And this old Hippocratic uh, a research program was uh, taken to the next level in the 19th century in a very systematic way. Uh, and physicians were backed up by the state. In the middle, you see um, a statistics of the cholera epidemic in London in 1849. Um, statistics very much came to the help of, of the state. Of course, the state needed to, to, to make um, a society transparent. They had to know about uh, gender, class, in order to be able to, uh, to, to come up with uh, policies. So to your left you see contaminated water with the death uh, pumping it up for the children, causing cholera of course, and to your right you see uh, the policies um, that sanitary uh, pol sanitary policies um, again in uh, London. It's a sewer system that originated in London in the 19th century. But there was also another response, which was laboratory medicine. To the left we see Louis Pasteur, to the right Robert Koch, and they were the ones who discovered bacteria. 
And they were the ones who established for the very first time that the uh, <clears throat> infectious diseases were caused by specific microbiological agents, bacteria. So only this bacteria could cause that uh, disease, uh, which, which was a major step forward, of course, um, for the moment only in terms of diagnostics. But in the end, uh, in the 1940s, when Fleming uh, discovered penicillin, um, there were remedies available as well. So that le led to a, a serious bacteriological revolution and progress in medicine. But then the important and very crucial question that McNeil is asking, had the eternal pattern been broken by the rise of the movement and by the rise of laboratory medicine? And in fact, his answer is no. He's arguing while 20th century medicine has effectively called, controlled a number of deadly diseases, world leaders, and also doctors maybe, seem to have become complacent, leading to many outbreaks over the course of the century. The Spanish flu is, of course, the most uh, famous or infamous, but after that, the, there's the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu, the swine flu, and what have you. So. I, I told you earlier that the book by McNeil was both speculative and rather experimental, and uh, it was criticized because of it. But of course, um, he set the research agenda that is now uh, being followed up by uh, uh, historians who are collaborating with archaeologists, geneticists, and epidemiologists. And this leads, so basically they're, they're, they're following the same path of McNeil, but they're opening the global picture by moving beyond literary sources. So they're not just sticking to Europe anymore, uh, because Europe, of course, produced many literacy, literary sources. But now we can only also move to the Americas, Africa, and Asia using um, human remains, skeletons, um, geological structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to find out about. Uh, precise uh, in a very precise way about disease patterns so uh, pathogenic agents are identified and classified and um, disease is being differentiated in space and time which is true progress in uh, let's say historical uh, pathological paleopathology but having said that and the reason why McNeil's book was so prophetic there's still the logic of parasitism. And to quote from McNeil, it remains obvious that humanity is in cause of one of the most massive and extraordinary ecological upheavals the planet has ever known. He's writing this in 1976. Ingenuity, knowledge, and organization alter but cannot cancel humanity's vulnerability to invasion by parasitic forms of life. Infectious disease will remain one of the fundamental determinants of human history. Indeed, preliminary conclusion of the first part on endemics, they are caused by military conquests, long distance trade and migration. The response to them was initially a mix of lifestyle, environmental and medical measures in, well, along the lines of the Hippocratic tradition. And from the late 19th century onwards, increasingly biomedicine came to prevail. Having said that, um, although this was highly successful, magic bullet approach, identify a specific uh, causative agent and then use a vaccine to kill it, uh, did not prove to be sufficient, which leads us to part two, the rhythm of a pandemic. So regardless, if you're talking about the N29 uh, pandemic or the Justinian pandemic or the Black Death or uh, the Colombian exchange or cholera or COVID-19, all pandemics seem to have the same kind of rhythm. And the famous medical historian Charles Rosenberg suggests uh, that we take a dramaturgic look uh, to uh, epidemics because the, the, the course of, of an ep any epidemic um, 
has a, a narrative course. There's a, there's a sequence, a dramaturgic sequence. So all epidemics have things in common. Uh, there's sudden widespread death um, to which is responded uh, from a particular configuration of cultural assumptions and institutional forms. Of course, in the highly Christian Middle Ages, people um, coped differently with disease and death and bad luck and, and other things than we do. Uh, so that is uh, context and time uh, specific. But uh, having said that, the, the rhythm, the, the, the phases of the cause of them uh, are very similar. So the first act in an, a pandemic is uh, called progressive revelation by uh, Rosenberg. Yeah. There, there was one more question about transatlantic exchange. Yeah. Victor, can you please ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, well, I had a question about the transatlantic exchange. Um, because I get how it decimated the Native Americans because they, uh, the Spanish conquistadors uh, carried the um, smallpox with them. But um, I was wondering why um, the coin fell uh, on behalf of the conquistadors in the way that the Aztecs were the victim here of uh, some sort of virus and not they themselves because eventually they were the ones conquering a new land which might also have had um, other viruses other than of course the bacteria causing syphilis. Yeah, no of course that's why it's called uh, the idea is and again it, it, I mean, Neil was still rather speculative so now with this uh, genetic and archaeological research people try to pinpoint whether or not he was right but he suggested that um, both Europe and America were, um, well, ecological systems that had a more or less an, uh, a, uh, an equilibrium within themselves. So they had acquired immunity for the diseases that, that were um, endemic in their own disease pool. But once, when, when they crossed the, the, the epidemiological boundaries, being the Atlantic, moving to uh, different uh, territory, um, they met with uh, different strange uh, new bacteria and viruses to which they uh, had no defense yet. And this, uh, this went both ways. So whereas the Aztecs um, contracted smallpox, uh, conquistadores contracted syphilis, bringing it back with them to, to Europe. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, well, I, I get I get that part, um, but um, like the initial uh, Spanish uh, uh, conquistadors, um, they could have also been wiped out by some virus that were was endemic to the Aztecs. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you're right, but that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, but but there's no <laughs> there's no logical reason for that yeah. not to have happened. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let me um, move on. So act one is progressive revelation. So in, in the beginning, uh, people are very unwilling to acknowledge that indeed this is an epidemic or e even a pandemic causing much uh, morbidity and mortality um, be be for economic reasons, very obvious economic reasons. Because if and when this is a contagious disease, it is clear that the authorities are expected to down to, to have a quarantine and they are very uh, reluctant to do so so slow if unwilling recognition of the epidemic because stakes are high that's the first phase then the second phase is managing randomness so people see and they cannot ignore anymore that there is sudden uh, and catastrophic death uh, death in a very arbitrary way they cannot understand it. In 1832 with the cholera, cholera was endemic in Europe, but the, the, the cholera, the European cholera was called uh, uh, cholera nostra, eh? our cholera, our cozy cholera. Whereas the, the new uh, cholera coming from the East was called cholera asiatica. So it was from there, from the, from the strange and, and uh, animals orient. 
So we, we, not everybody was dying and, and people did not understand it. So um, it was very arbitrary. So what in the second phase people tend to do is to come to grips with arbitrariness because they want to understand. They want to create meaning where there is none. And they do this in all kinds of ways. So, um, for example, um, accusing the Jews, uh, accusing homosexuals, accusing Chinese, accusing ourselves because we have sinned, uh, well, whatever. So it's a rather eclectic mix of both moral and secular scientific elements. But it's still very bewildering diversity of explanatory uh, strategies. Then phase three, things tend to settle down. It is a negotiated pub public response. So within society, both the church and science and politicians arrive at a certain uh, consensus, uh, which leads to collective action. And this can be prayer and fasting, but also isolation, disinfecting, vaccination, etc., etc. And then finally, when the epidemic subsides, when it's gone, people tend to look back because they want to learn from it. More often than not, this, 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 this lesson has a moral character. So they, they, they provide um, a psychological peace of mind, they provide closure by, 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 by calling it, by giving it a meaning, which is a moral meaning. Well, with this scheme in mind, I would like to, this is just, uh, well, a little bit of an experiment, and please feel free to step in. Maybe you agree, maybe you don't, but I would like to use this, um, this, um, uh, to COVID-19. First, the first act, progressive revelation. It's ignoring and downplaying. Uh, well, we've seen that. Uh, ruling out a recurrence of SARS because SARS was very serious indeed. And yesterday, when the virologist talked to us, um, she told us that COVID-19 is basically um, giving SARS another name because it's basically the second generation of SARS. But we don't call it. Then uh, saying things like, it's only limited to China, so we don't need to worry. Uh, it's but a flu. It's not so serious. It happens every year or it will quickly go away. So this is the very first response to COVID-19. Let's say in, in Europe, in the Netherlands, January, the 1st of February. Frank, may I interrupt again? Yeah. There, there was one question about uh, your st stages of the pandemic. I would like to ask Vera to ask her question. Yeah, yeah. that's me. Um, so you were saying that the fourth phase, so the fourth act is that the pan pandemic is over, but what are actually the criteria for it? So at what point could you say that the pandemic is over? Because I think it's easy to understand like what causes it, but when can you say that it is over actually? At what point? Yeah, thank you. Well, of course, let's, let's um, take AIDS. Rosenberg has, um, has illustrated his scheme uh, talking about AIDS and AIDS of course is not yet over but he means to say it's under control and we understand it. So uh, we can now diagnose it, uh, we can make sense of it, we know what causes it, we know how to keep it in control, not cure it maybe, it, but it's now, it has entered a new phase, the phase of chronic disease. So uh, that is the time when, when the panic of first and second moment is over and we can afford the luxury to rethink, to, to, to take stock, to look back, and to, to give it a meaning and to, 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 let's say, integrate it into our lives. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of. But I was also, also, it's kind of surprising that even though still many people are infected, you could still say that the pandemic is over, even though people still have it. That's quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. But, but so I meant it's under control and we can allow, allow ourselves to speak uh, about HIV AIDS um, in, a, in, a, in a casual way. Yeah. 
And then yeah, because I was so because you said that example, I was also thinking about this. So there. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was another question by J. Janssen. Yeah. That was still on the conquistadors. <laughs> oh, I have only there? 20 minutes. <laughs> that is fine. It was just another perspective on looking at that question. Ah. So you're, you're okay? Yeah, I basically just said there are a lot of conquistadors that might have never returned because they came across a disease yeah, from course. another region. Of course, yeah. So basically, they just got lucky that the Aztecs had something that was left. Yeah. No, but again, like I said, McNeil wrote a very speculative and experimental book. He wrote read history with very broad, broad strokes. And we have now reached uh, the moment with um, paleopathology and genetics and archaeology where we can really pinpoint the details. So now we, we no doubt will establish that indeed many conquistadores died from whatever in uh, South America. You're right, yeah. Okay, so, and then uh, Stephen has a question about this, this slide. Okay. Yeah, um, if I understood you correctly, you said that this first act of the, of the pandemic is mostly the, um, like the evading of the, um, naming the pandemic and downplaying the pandemic but don't you think that is also more likely to arise from the fact that people just don't know what they're dealing with rather than uh, deliberately downplaying the virus or the pandemic because other than silencing the doctors in china or um, what you see in a cartoon it's often also that people don't know what they're dealing with i guess yeah no, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Um, but so we, we just want to get on with our lives, right? So we want to party and to go to soccer matches, etc. And when this is indeed a serious pandemic, that uh, interferes with everything that we tr uh, treasure. So um, we'll see what happens. It's that kind of attitude. Does that satisfy you? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's a, a bit of a naive p perspective on, on the human willingness to cooperate. I think, but maybe maybe it's just the first phase of a pandemic that yeah yeah people don't realize the. Um, are you the, are you one of the students? Uh, of I the, am. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe we can just dis discuss this next. Oh, not of the course, no, but uh, ah. a student I am. But ah, that's okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, phase two, managing randomness. So uh, yesterday, the virologist said that the director general of the WHO already warned us against fear, rumors, and stigma, because that is very counterproductive, if not destructive. This is what you see happening now. So the US is accusing uh, China uh, of bio warfare. China is doing the same towards the U.S. Of course, they are the biggest players in the world, in the world stage uh, at the moment. Anti-vaxxers accuse Bill Gates and his whole vaccination program, suggesting that he is ha has inserted microchips in vaccines in order to counter overpopulation. Holistic practitioners um, are saying it's all a default of 5G. And, and many who be, uh, people who believe it set a fire to 5G. Um, uh, of course, has many enemies, and they include China, the Democrats, Obama, and the WHO. And all these, all this rumbling, all this eclectic mix of anxiety and fear and stigmata, is amplified by social media, making it very uh, uh, dangerous and destabilizing. I would say. And maybe we are now, at least in the Netherlands, in phase three. We just witnessed uh, a press conference by the prime minister uh, negotiating public response. And it starts with the recognition of, yes, indeed, this is human to human transmission, and we have to work on it. Uh, the WHO first calling it a global emergency and then a pandemic. And of course, the term that they use to denote uh, what is happening here has repercussions, very important implications for the way we deal with it. 
then politicians, at least in the Netherlands, um, uh, calling for responsible citizenship, calling uh, citizens to uh, social distance, to wash their hands, to wear masks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Quarantine, lockdown of countries and economies, and of course, as a consequence of that, giving financial help for individuals and uh, companies. And last but certainly not least, concerted effort of global research. So uh, whereas medical science tends to be very uh, competitive, what we now see is that there's global collaboration to find out about uh, uh, virus. And this is looking in the future. Of course, historians don't do that. But one, if and when and once uh, COVID subsides, we can make, try to make sense of it all uh, looking back. And then we can try to establish, was this indeed a wake up call? Or are we returning uh, to business as usual, as happened very often in the past? And many people suggest uh, possible scenarios. For example, we should use COVID-19 to move from long distance consumption and global uh, consumption to regional autarky. So we should produce in the Netherlands what we consume in the Netherlands and not um, uh, import uh, goods that are uh, produced elsewhere, um, destabilizing uh, the eco ecological equilibrium. We should also move, according to some, from fossil economy to the Green New Deal, which has enormous repercussions, of course, for the way we organize society. We should move from competitive to open science and from global inequality to equity. Well, this may be very naive and idealistic. Uh, maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. We, won't we, are, we, we simply don't know. But looking back at history and looking at the, the way we live now, we have to confess that the logic of the traditional way of doing is very strong. Vested interests are enormous and political will is limited. So if and when, the global community wants to change things and use COVID-19 uh, as a wake-up call, many, many things have to be uh, taken care of. I will move to part three, talking about two approaches to pandemics, to epidemics in general, but also pandemics. <laughs> So when, when a country or a region or a continent is uh, confronted with a pandemic, there are many efforts uh, put in place to make sense of it, either uh, re religiously or scientifically or politically or whatever. And this is always uh, a function of a particular generation's cultural and intellectual assumptions. Of course, in the Middle Ages, they were unaware of genes. And um, in our day and age, we... Uh, um, don't resort to prayer anymore. Well, we, the majority, of course. So this is again culture specific, time specific, and place specific. But Rosenberg generalizes um, there are two, basically two different approaches to pandemics. And he calls them the configuration approach and the contamination approach. Configuration approach. Uh, he qualifies as being holistic, multi-causal, contextual, environmental, and anti-contagious, which means that um, doctors and politicians, but also lay people, um, tend to think of the world as an integrated whole, rather than focus on one specific issue, like um, in the, uh, the contam contamination approach is done tends to be a reductionist, monocausal, specific individual, and contagionist. And um, very generally, I don't know if you're aware of, of the traditions uh, pre-bacteriology, uh, but the configuration approach you could call um, my, miasma theory, uh, and the contamination approach equals uh, contagionism. But then something very crucial happened in the 19th century with Koch and Pasteur. Uh, germ theory was launched and uh, bacteriology favored the second approach, which is the contamination approach, which led to a st strong focus on the identification of uh, 
microbiological agents and the eradication of them. So then we may ask, as McNeil did in his book, have we reached progress through eradication? Of course we have. But contrary to the hopes triggered by the antibiotic revolution, infectious disease is still among us. So there are new diseases, and there's a list here, here uh, but there are also re-emerging diseases, diseases that we thought were under control, but are uh, returning again. So despite scientific breakthroughs, um, we, we still have not, ered well, we have eradicated only one disease, smallpox, uh, but apart from that, we are looking at the change of climate and ecosystems, mutation of viruses, growing vaccine resistance, population growth, urbanization, and growing global mobility. And this leads to viral spillovers, not just from one region to another, and from, from China to the rest of the world, but also from the animal world to man. And it leads to emerging and re-emerging diseases. So we simply have to acknowledge that we are living in a complex and vulnerable world and that uh, complacency and hubris may constitute our most important threat. To quote from Rosenberg, put simply, monolithic version of neither positions remains intellectual ad intellectually adequate. We need an ethnography as well as an ecology to explain the network of interactions underlying the appearance, diminution, recrudescence of particular infectious ills. Without history and pol political economy, we can have neither a meaningful ethnology nor a meaningful ecology. And certainly we cannot have an effective epidemiology. So the final part, 10 minutes left, something like that. So Rosenberg has identified the two basic approaches, which the first one is environmentalism and the other one is the biomedical approach. And of course, it should not be either or, but it should be a combination of both approaches. So I would now like to move to global health because the, 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 the globe has um, turned into a glo global village, that much is clear. So we have to look at the world, at the globe, as if it is one community, but how to deal with the problems we are facing. And I would like to put human agency back in. So remember that McNeil said, well, let's uh, look at viruses and bacteria and forget about human genius. But uh, I think that it makes sense to put back in man, the human dimension, because it proves insufficient to only focus on bacteria and viruses alone. So what are the goals of global health? Well, first commercial, secondly, humanitarian. Of course, there's an enormous niche for uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example, and biomedical research. Um, and if the whole world is your potential patient, that is a very attractive and viable business model. But on the other hand, there's, of course, a humanitarian uh, motive to engage in global health, which is creating, trying to create a sustainable health system. Which are the means that we have at our disposal? First, the technological fix, which is quarantine drugs and vaccines, which is, let's say, the, the contagionist approach. And secondly, improving living conditions, like improving housing and establishing sanitation. And post-89, we can say that uh, with the end of the Cold War, we have moved to a new neoliberal global world order. And global health um, transcends the role of states and includes many stakeholders. So it's not just states. Public health is typically something that is organized within a state. From the 19th century onwards, it was the national state in co collaboration with the national medical profession and national um, medical research centers that uh, collaborated in a, in, in a concerted effort to improve the health of um, society, that national society. 
But as we all know, the role of na nation states has, has dwindled and um, uh, we are now looking at uh, bigger uh, unities of political decision making, which also includes non-governmental and even commercial parties. So we are now witness of the rise of public-private partnerships, as they are called, um, which entails new alliances between UNICEF, the World Bank Global Fund, but also the Gates Foundation and vaccine manufacturers. So um, let's say they are called uh, philanthro-capitalists and pharmaceutical companies now collaborate and cooperate with the UN, the WHO and other organizations. And the, the kind of approach they have, have uh, opted for is uh, eradication through vaccination. So the Alma-Ata approach established in 1978 seems to have been abandoned. So the two approaches are embodied, you could say, by two organizations that you might very well know. On the one hand, Médecins Sans Frontières, and on the other hand, Partners in Health. And they're very symbolic for the, the two approaches that Rosenberg uh, distinguishes. Médecins Sans Frontières is least focused in on intervening, ad hoc, triage, apolitical, short-term, biomedical. So very much comparable to the contamination approach of Rosenberg. Partners in Health, on the other hand, is keen on building basic health services and structures and commits long-term to communities in the um, majority world, as it is called. And they opt for a developmental approach, uh, which is, of course, a slow approach and much less, um, uh, well, heroic, you could say and comparable with the configuration approach um, that uh, Rosenberg suggests. And this is my final slide um, and uh, containing a quote from uh, a wonderful book. I can recommend you to read it. It's a history of global health. And he finishes the book very much in line with Rosenberg with my lecture as follows. Global health today it contains elements of both, yet it has overwhelmingly become subject to technical approaches that have their origins in colonial medicine at the beginning of the 20th century. This is not to dismiss the value of Médecins Sans Frontières or the approach it represents. Yet, without basic health care, many existing and emerging health problems will go unattended. If history tells us anything, it is that finding a vaccine will save lives, but it will also delay efforts to build health systems and alleviate the structural causes of disease. Thank you very much for your attention.